and welcome to Down the Spirituality and Science Rabbit Hole podcast number 22, entitled Two Modes of Knowing. The Greatest Physicists Were Mystics. Now, this is actually a continuation in some form of podcast number 21. So, if you haven't listened to podcast number 21 on quantum field theory, you may want to go back and listen to that before listening to this podcast. So, one little caveat here before we start. What I am definitely not saying in this podcast is that science proves spirituality and mysticism. That is not the case. What I am trying to show, however, is that there is nothing in science that precludes it, and there may actually be some interesting things being discovered in quantum physics that gives ideas and insights into spirituality. The common tendency, when faced with the truly ultimate issues of existence, is to assume, or perhaps at least hope, that physics and mysticism would somehow converge on a similar set of answers, that physics would somehow support or even prove a mystical worldview. That simple conclusion, however, was not believed by any of the great physicists in this podcast. From Einstein to Eddington, from Bohr to Planck, from Eisenberg to Pauli, they uniformly rejected that conclusion. They rejected the notion that physics proves or even supports mysticism, and yet every one of them was an avowed mystic. Physics can be learned by the study of facts and mathematics, but mysticism can only be learned by a profound change in consciousness. All these pioneering physicists believed that both science and religion, physics and spirituality were necessary for a complete and full and even integral approach to reality, but neither could be reduced to or derived from the other. In these days when so many spiritual seekers are conflicted regarding the findings of science, it is important that we listen to the true giants of physics as they point to the fundamental importance of both science and religion. So here is a list of the heavy hitters in physics that were active between, let's say, the early 1900s up to about oh, 1950 or 1960. Werner Eisenberg is famous for his uncertainty principle, but he actually wrote some interesting articles. Uh, Scientific and Religious Truths were one of them, and another one was Science and the Beautiful. Erwin Schrodinger was perhaps the most mystical of the group here. He was responsible for the famous wave equation, and his articles are The Openness of Mind, The Eye That Is God, and lastly, My Mystic Vision. Arthur Eddington was an astronomer, and he wrote Beyond the Veil of Physics. Another was Mind Stuff, and lastly, he wrote In Defense of Mysticism. Now, everyone's probably familiar with Einstein, Einstein wrote two articles that are of interest, Cosmic Religious Feeling and Science and Religion. Louis de Brogue was a physicist and he was also an aristocrat and was fairly wealthy. He wrote The Aspiration Toward Spirit and The Mechanism Demands a Mysticism. James Jeans was a mathematician who wrote two articles, one called In the Mind of Some Eternal Spirit and another called A Universe of Pure Thought. Max Planck was a theoretical physicist and he wrote an article called The Mystery of Our Being. And finally, Wolfgang Pauli, who was a theoretical physicist, 
wrote the book Embracing the Rationale and the Mystical. The central mystical experience may be fairly, if somewhat poetically, described as follows. In the mystical consciousness, reality is apprehended directly and immediately, meaning without any mediation. Any symbolic elaboration, any conceptualization, or any abstractions. Subject and object become one in a timeless and spaceless act that is beyond all forms of mediation. Mystics universally speak of contacting reality in its suchness, its, its isness, its thatness, without any intermediaries. It is beyond words, beyond symbols, names, thoughts, and even images. Now, when the physicist looks at quantum reality or at relativistic reality, he is not looking at the things in themselves, at direct or non-mediated reality. Rather, the physicist is looking at nothing but a set of highly abstract differential equations, not at reality itself, but at mathematical symbols of that reality. As Bohr put it, it must be recognized that we are here dealing with a purely symbolic procedure. We can never understand what events are, but must limit ourselves to describing the patterns of events in their mathematical terms. No other aim is possible. Physicists who are trying to understand nature may work in many different fields and by many different methods. One may dig, one may sow, one may reap. But the final harvest will always be a sheaf of mathematical equations. These will never describe nature itself. Thus, our studies can never put us into contact with true reality. In other words, the calculations give you the correct answers for experiments. So just do the math and not try to figure out what it means. What an absolute, radical, irredeemable difference from mysticism. The very nature, aim, and results of the approaches are profoundly different. Quantum mechanics dealing with abstract and immediate symbols and forms of reality, whereas mysticism is dealing with a direct and non-mediated approach to reality itself. What this means is that the exploration of the external world by the methods of physical science leads not to a concrete reality, but to a shadow world of symbols beneath which those methods are inappropriate for penetrating reality. What, in brief, was the crucial difference between the old Newtonian and the new quantum physics such that the latter tended much more often to be conducive to mysticism? Both the old and the new physics were dealing with shadow symbols, but the new physics was forced to be aware of that fact, forced to be aware that it was dealing with shadows and illusions, not reality. Thus, in perhaps the most famous and oft-quoted passage of any of these theorists, Arthur Eddington elo eloquently states, and I quote, in the world of physics, we watch a shadow graph performance of familiar life. The shadow of my elbow rests on the shadow table as the shadow ink flows over the shadow paper. End of quote. This frank realization that physical science is concerned with a shadow world is one of the most significant of recent advances. Schrodinger drives the point home. As he says, please note that the very recent advance of quantum and relativistic physics does not lie in the world of physics itself having acquired this shadowy character. It had ever since Democritus and even before, but we were not aware of it. We thought we were dealing with the world itself. Sir James Jeans summarizes it perfectly right down to the metaphor. He says, the essential fact is simply 
that all the pictures which science now draws of nature and which alone seem capable of according with observational fact are mathematical pictures, and they are nothing more than pictures, fictions if you like, if by fiction you mean that science is not yet in contact with the ultimate reality. Many would hold that, from the broad philosophical standpoint, the outstanding achievement of 20th century physics is not the theory of relativity with its welding together of space and time, or the theory of quanta with its present apparent negation of the laws of causation, nor is it the dissection of the atom with the resultant discovery that things are not what they seem, but it is the general recognition that we are not yet in contact with ultimate reality. We are still imprisoned in Plato's cave with our backs to the light and can only watch the shadows on the wall. There is the great difference between the old and the new physics. Both are dealing with shadows, but the old physics didn't recognize the fact. To put it in a nutshell, According to this view, physics deals with shadows. To go beyond shadows is to go beyond physics. To go beyond physics is to head toward the metaphysical or the mystical. And that is why so many of our pioneering physicists of, this, of the last century were mystics. The new physics contributed nothing positive to this mystical venture except a spectacular failure from whose smoking ruins the spirit of mysticism gently arises. In fact, the science and religion argument consists of nothing more than a jockeying for definitions selected in advance to produce precisely the conclusion desired. Thus, for instance, if you define science simply as knowledge, then contemplative religion becomes a form of science. As a matter of fact, it becomes the highest science. This approach is often taken by present-day Eastern masters who continually speak of the science of yoga, the science of meditation, the science of creative intelligence, and so on. On the other hand, if you define science as empirical sensory knowledge instrumentally validated, then virtually all forms of religion become non-scientific. You then have one of two paths open. Number one, you can view religion as a perfectly valid form of personal faith, values, and belief not open to scientific scrutiny. These are said to be two different but equally legitimate domains between which there can properly be neither conflict nor compromise nor parallels. Number two is to view religion as non-scientific in the purely pejorative sense, as a superstitious relic of magical and primitive thinking, or a defense mechanism exploiting guilt and anxiety, or an opaque ideology institutionalizing alienation, or a debilitating projection of men's and women's inward and humanistic yearnings, or a purely private emotional affair harmless in itself, but not deserving the title knowledge. Now, all of this confusion, you see, rests in large measure on how you define science. The issues are so complex and subtle that if we don't specify precisely what we mean by science, and later what we mean by religion, then statements about the relation between the two become silly at best and sinister at worst. We are free to define science any way we wish as long as we are consistent, but it seems to me that at the very least we must distinguish between the method of science and the domain of science. The method of science refers to the ways or means that whatever it is we call science has managed to gather facts, data, or information and manages to confirm or refute propositions vis-a-vis -vis that data. Method, in other words, refers to ways in which science manages to gather data. Scientific domain, on the other hand, 
simply refers to the types of events or phenomena that become or can become objects of investigation by whatever it is we mean by science. Method refers to the epistemology of science, while domain refers to the ontology. Epistemology means the nature of knowledge. Ontology basically means origins. So all this may have been a bit difficult to wrap your minds around, so let's have an example here. Let's go explore some caves and find out what's inside. We take a flashlight with us. That is our means or our method of gaining knowledge or of shedding light on various caves. And the caves are the current objects or domains that we will investigate and illuminate with our methodology. In other words, with our flashlight. The point is that the same flashlight might discover very different types of objects, and we don't want to confuse those objects simply because the same flashlight was used to find them. Instead of asking vaguely, what is science? Let us therefore ask, what is a scientific method and what is a scientific domain? So now that we know what the scientific method is, let's go back to our original thesis here and ask a question. But aren't physics and mysticism, or science and mysticism, simply two different approaches to the same underlying reality, two paths to the same knowledge? Ultimately, no, because science is based on a dualistic worldview wherein the universe is severed into subject versus object, as well as truth versus falsity, or good versus evil. It is the very cornerstone of Western philosophy, theology, and science, for Western philosophy is, by and large, Greek philosophy, and Greek philosophy is the philosophy of dualisms. So within this dualistic philosophy, the scientific methodology of measurement became the new religion because it allowed for the first time a systematic procedure for empirically verifying a proposition. All propositions were to be confined to that which was objectively measurable and verifiable. In short, if something didn't submit to these criteria, then it just did not exist or plainly was not worth knowing. However, on some levels at least, science was an open system, although it flatly rejected the non-measurable, the non-objective, and the non-verifiable, it nevertheless pursued its own course honestly and rigorously to its ultimate conclusion. Now, all that sounds reasonable and good as long as, in, as, long as you are working in the realm of Newtonian physics. The basic assumption that one could drastically experiment on the universe without affecting it was found untenable by quantum physics that came later. It discovered that in some mysterious fashion, the subject and object were intimately united, and the myriad of theories that had assumed otherwise were now in shambles. The quantum revolution was so cataclysmic because it attacked not one or two conclusion of classical physics, but its very cornerstone, the foundation upon which the whole edifice was erected, and that was the subject-object dualism. That which was real was supposed to be that which could be objectively observed and measured. The discovery that objective measurement and verification could no longer be the mark of absolute reality was shocking to most. This was because the measured object could never be completely separated from the measuring subject. The measured and the measurer, the verified and the verifier, since at this level they are one and the same. When the universe is severed into a subject versus an object, into one state which sees versus one state which is seen, something always gets left out. Not only was physics in turmoil, but also logic and mathematics, when a young mathematician named Kurt Gödel 
then only 25 years old, questioned their validity. Known today as the incompleteness theorem, it embodies a rigorous mathematical demonstration that every encompassing system of logic must have at least one premise that cannot be proven or verified without contradicting itself. Thus, according to Gödel, it is impossible to establish the logical consistency of any complex deductive system except by assuming principles of reasoning whose own internal consistency is as open to question as that of the system itself. So at the bottom of the physical world is Eisenberg's uncertainty principle, and at the bottom of the mental world is Gödel's incompleteness theorem. When science had started with the dualism between subject and object, it had started badly. All sensations of matter exist nowhere but in the human mind. Doesn't that demonstrate that matter is really nothing but an idea? In short, quantum physics had taken another dualism, that of mental versus material, to the annihilating edge, and there it had vanished. As Erwin Schrodinger, co-founder of quantum field theory, put it bluntly, he said, Subject and object are only one. The barrier between them cannot be said to have broken down as a result of recent experiments in the physical sciences, for this barrier does not exist. Schrodinger commented on the many paradoxes in quantum physics by saying, these shortcomings can hardly be avoided except by abandoning dualism. Abandoning dualism is exactly what quantum field theory has done. Besides relinquishing the illusionary division between subject and object, wave and particle, mind and body, mental and material, the new physics, with the brilliant help of Albert Einstein, abandoned the dualism of space and time, energy and matter, and even space and objects. One physicist was quoted to say, the universe is so constructed that the opposite of a true statement is a false statement, but the opposite of a, of a profound truth is usually another profound truth. In relinquishing the core dualism of subject versus object, these physicists had in principle relinquished, relinquished all dualisms. And the very basis of this creating two worlds from one is the dualistic illusion that the subject is fundamentally separate and distinct from the object. As we have seen, this is exactly the insight that these physicists had stumbled upon. The culminating insight of 300 years of persistent and consistent scientific research. Of utmost importance was that these scientists could realize the inadequacy of dualistic knowledge only by recognizing the possibility of another mode of knowing reality, a mode of knowing that does not operate by separating the knower and the known, the subject and the object. Arthur Eddington explains this second mode of knowing. He says, We have two kinds of knowledge, which I call symbolic knowledge and intimate knowledge. The more customary forms of reasoning have been developed for symbolic knowledge only. The intimate knowledge will not submit to codification and analysis, or rather, when we attempt to analyze it, the intimacy is lost and it is replaced by symbolism. Eddington calls the second mode of knowing intimate because the subject and object are intimately united in its operation. As soon as the dualism of subject and object arises, however, this intimacy is lost and is replaced by symbolism. All symbolic knowledge is dualistic knowledge. Western intellectual disciplines were not dealing with the world itself because they were operating through the dualistic mode of knowing and hence were working with symbolic representations of the world. However illuminating and detailed these pictures may be, they remain just that, pictures. They therefore stand in to reality 
just as a picture of the moon stands to the real moon. An example of this is the map territory relationship. The territory is the world process in its actuality, while a map is any symbolic notation that represents or signifies some aspect of the territory. The obvious point is that the map is not the ter territory. Therefore, the word sky is not itself blue. The word water will not quench your thirst, and the word steak will not satisfy your hunger. As Schrodinger pointed out, however, the problem comes as soon as we forget that the map is not the territory, as soon as we confuse our symbols of reality with reality itself. To approach the deeper reality beyond is nothing more than to discover the actuality of the territory from which all of our maps are drawn, to discover an approach to the territory that dispenses temporarily, at least, with all maps whatsoever. If the only knowledge that is academically respectable is symbolic map knowledge, we will very shortly have nothing but maps about maps about maps, and we will have long forgotten the territory that was the original object of our investigation. We have then available to us two basic modes of knowing. As these physicists discovered, one that has been variously termed symbolic or map or inferential or dualistic knowledge, while the other has been called intimate or direct or non-dual knowledge. This inadequacy led many physicists to draw on the second or intimate mode of knowing, or at least to envisage the necessity of this type of knowledge. These two forms of knowing are also clearly distinguished in Hinduism, as stated in the Mandaka Upanishad. The lower mode corresponds to what we have called symbolic map knowledge. It is inferential, conceptual, and comparative knowledge. The higher mode is reached not through a progressive movement through the lower orders of knowledge. This higher mode corresponds to our second or non-dual mode of knowing, for it is a unique, self-certifying, intuitive vision of non-duality. In addition, in Mahayana Buddhism, the symbolic mode and the non-dual mode are also present. Alfred North Whitehead pointed out most forcefully that the core characteristics of the symbolic form of knowing are abstraction and bifurcation. According to Whitehead, the process of abstraction, useful as it may be in everyday discourse, is ultimately false in the sense that it operates by noting the salient features of an object and ignoring all else and therefore abstraction is nothing else than a mission of part of the truth. The symbolic mode of knowing also operates by bifurcation, by dividing the seamless coat of the universe and hence does violence to the very universe it seeks to understand. Therefore, we have mistaken our abstractions for concrete realities, a mistake that Whitehead, Whitehead termed the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Opposed to this mode of knowing is what Whitehead called prehension, which is an intimate, direct, non-abstract, non-dual feel of reality. If we are to perceive reality, it is to the second mode of knowing that we must eventually turn. Well, I, I just couldn't resist this. For those of you that like old movies, Let's hearken back to the movie A Few Good Men with Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson. Buried in the end of that movie, what might be the most profound philosophical statement ever uttered. I'll give you a few seconds to just look at it here and contemplate. So, are the methods of the mental or spiritual sciences the same as those of the physical sciences? Now let me give you a kind of a bifurcated answer. Yes and no. Yes, in that the central methodological criterion, 
namely that all knowledge claims ultimately be settled on the basis of direct appeal to experience is identical in all the genuine sciences, physical, biological, psychological, and spiritual. No, in that each domain in science has quite different characteristics and thus the actual application of the scientific method in each domain takes on the form, as it were, of that domain. So a typical knowledge claim in the physical science could be a proton has 2,000 times the mass of an electron, whereupon we proceed to test the claim through complicated instrumental procedures. Let me start with a definition here. Hermeneutic means the inner subjective realm of the communicative exchange. So, on the other hand, a typical knowledge claim in the mental realm is the meaning of Hamlet is such and such, which we then test in the hermeneutic circle realm of those who have read and studied Hamlet. Bad interpretations can be rebuffed by the hermeneutic circle, thus assuring a quasi-objective status for all genuine truth claims. But here we are not so much judging extension as we are intention, so measurement plays a minor role. Likewise, a typical knowledge claim in the spiritual realm is, does a dog have Buddha nature? There is a specific repeatable, verifiable, experiential test and answer to that question. A bad answer can most definitely be refuted, but it has virtually nothing to do with physical measurement or mental intentionality. So let us conclude this podcast by turning back to physics once more and subatomic particles. All things are not ultimately made of subatomic particles. All things, including subatomic particles, are ultimately derived from fields, which appear to have somewhat spiritual properties. Now, fields are a property of the entire universe, so one might say the universe is in some way God. And the material realm, far from being the most significant, is the least significant. It has less being than life, which has less being than mind, which has less being than soul, which has less being than spirit. Physics is simply the study of the realm of the least being. Claiming that all things are ultimately made of subatomic particles is thus the most reductionistic stance imaginable.